Chloe said, my name is Michael Silverman, and I am from suburbia. <laughs> However, I am from one of the most beautiful suburbias that could ever exist, on the southwest coast of Connecticut, about an hour from New York City. But anyone else who grew up in suburbia here? Not much to do is the problem, right, often? So this is where the cool kids hang out in Westport, Connecticut, where I grew up. This is Jessup Green. Um, just on the, over there on the right, there's a bench. Next to that, there's a payphone. Uh, when it gets a little bit darker, it's a great place to um, hide and smoke and hang out and basically do nothing at all. And then, when you're done with Jessup Green, what you can do is walk about half a mile to the other end of Main Street, and there's Westport Pizza. This is the number two most happening spot in Westport. Um, <laughs> And across from Westport Pizza is, is another payphone. So when you're done hanging out, doing nothing, uh, maybe sneaking some cigarettes or something, you get to call your parents and get picked up because you're maybe not even 16, maybe not even 18. So um, somewhere along the way during high school, I got involved in student government and then got involved from there in the town's youth commission. Not really sure what it was about, but it sounded interesting. Um, and during the process realized uh, with some others that there really ought to be some solution to this, nothing to do, no kind of cool, safe place to just go hang out as a high schooler, except sneak off to the beach or sneak, you know, deal your parents' alcohol or whatever you do. Um, there's gotta be some place where we could listen to music and just hang out normally. And uh, so fast forward, um, senior year, 1998, uh, Toke Hall opened first student coffee house in Westport, Connecticut, my hometown. Um, and this was, this was a kind of transformational experience for me. It was um, extremely exciting to see this come alive, but this idea come into reality. But, but more importantly for me, it was my first real experience in, in activism and in organizing and in engaging with, with a local community uh, to, to make something happen, to make an idea come to life. Um, we had to deal with grown-ups, and I had to go find other students at other schools and my school to go talk to the planning and zoning board and the, uh, the finance board and all these things, uh, all these political bodies to essentially authorize this, this great old space that wasn't being used above Main Street downtown to be turned into this, this cool coffee house. It was also, so it was personally empowering for the reasons I mentioned, but it, was also, uh, it also gave me this great faith in the political process and in, in the ability for government to, to do good things and change our world and make it a little bit better. Um, so that was, my, that was kind of my, my amateur entrance into politics. Um, during high school, I also got this, uh, this awareness or other people here have spoken about their connection to nature and the natural environment. I, I found that as well for me in high school, uh, having the opportunity to um, traveled to some beautiful wilderness areas in upstate New York, Adirondacks, and other places. And um, upon arriving at this beautiful place, Middlebury, uh, influenced in part by my love of the natural world, uh, I got a chance to read Bill McKibben's End of Nature book, which many of you probably have in some of your courses, and, taking some, and got a chance to take some other environmental studies classes here. I quickly <laughs> realized that if I give a damn about the planet and the natural world, I really need to start thinking about climate change getting involved in the climate crisis in some way. Um, so I had heard about this effort that uh, some, some folks within some of the environmental groups on campus had been involved with to make Middlebury, see about making Middlebury carbon neutral, minimize the whole campus's carbon footprint on the planet. And uh, it wasn't really working though. So it had been a few years, but it was kind of, you know, a bunch of folks with their Nalgene's and the Patagonia's, and it was not really taken seriously, right? <laughs> um, which was really frustrating for me, and I had this, just come from this experience where I saw this political process working. You know, people in ties and doing business of government, and it was working. So um, I had a role here in student government, and had kind of seen the way things work a little bit here, and by senior year, helped with a process that got this carbon reduction initiative proposal to a group of people that could actually say, yes, we as a campus, will will author, we, we as the people with power on this campus, will authorize this other set of people to go out and come up with a plan that ultimately got implemented to help make Middlebury one of the first carbon neutral campuses 
or get on the path to being one of the first carbon neutral campuses in the country. Um, so, very exciting, but in both the Middlebury and Westport examples, the issue was fairly localized, right? It, it was fairly, it was a pretty clear problem, and, and the solution, the path also was relatively simple in that we could get everyone we needed around the right table, right? We could go and talk to whoever we needed to talk to to make this change happen. Um, and, and before I move on, I should also note that, you know, much of the organizing that happens in the world doesn't enjoy the level of access uh, that I did. I was not, when I was in, when I was growing up, I did, did not have the challenge of trying to organize while dealing with issues of um, race or trying to get food on my table at the same time. So other people doing organizing, community organizing work, um, obviously working in a variety of different scenarios. So I just want to call that out. But leaving Middlebury, I, like many others, had no idea what the hell I was going to do. Thought if I wanted to make some kind of change or cared about the environment, I'd probably have to go sign up and work for a pretty big established nonprofit organization, maybe, I don't know, the Sierra Club, the Wilderness Society, something, the Nature Conservancy, right? Uh, didn't end up doing that. Uh, decided to head up the road. I had heard that our former governor, uh, Howard Dean, was looking to run for president. I was among maybe 10 other candidates who were running around the country giving speeches that were provocative. And uh, ended up being one of the first two dozen staff members of, of Howard Dean's presidential campaign. Right up the road in Burlington. Um, and I faced a very, very different and interesting challenge. Uh, we couldn't, what we needed to do was build this national campaign, some kind of national movement. No one ever heard of this guy. Barely, in, or outside of Vermont, right? He was barely uh, an asterisk in the polls. So um, the other thing that happened is that because he hadn't ever run for president or any major political office, he had no list of donors to call up for a whole bunch of money that we needed. And he had no list of people he could email or write to um, to start organizing or volunteering, any of that. All that we had was the internet and these free and open tools that were very quickly getting into the hands of almost the entire country. So this is, the, this is the glossy image that a lot of people remember from the campaign and the end of it, and when he rose to all kinds of unprecedented success. Um, this is unfortunate, but some other folks remember <laughs> at the end of the campaign. But um, this is really what the campaign looked like, right? Um, hundreds of thousands of individual people coming together around the shared common idea, or around a set of ideas, and a candidate and a person who was, who was representing them. It was, there was an incredible movement building experience, which I could spend much more time getting into and talking about. But uh, what I want to focus in on is the fact that this was a massive word of mouth effort. It couldn't have happened without the internet. There was all kinds of online word of mouth happening about this campaign, which enabled it to grow at the speed that it needed to in order to become an actual uh, legitimate campaign. But that online, all that online action, all the online buzz, uh, was also happening in the real world, in neighborhoods, person to person, neighbor to neighbor. And that was the focus of that was the focus of, of my my work on the campaign. We were using all the energy that we were building online to get people offline together in their communities. This goes back to the conversation we were having earlier about how real change happens and how it doesn't just happen through clicks on the internet. But this is the, this is the program that I was running, the National Meetup Program. Um, these are some folks in Salt Lake City who are getting together for one of their, their many monthly meetups. Um, regular folks who um, decided that you know, they all shared, a, they shared some common ideas about how the country could be better. And they signed up, they probably met through the internet, they probably, excuse me, found, about, found out about this event through the internet, came together, and um, through the program that we had set up, found some very specific and tangible ways that they could support the campaign, writing letters to undecided voters, recruiting new folks to come and join the campaign. Um, but, but that in and of itself is not what's interesting, right? People come together all the time to do things in, about in their community, just like I had found earlier. What was unprecedented was the fact that this was happening all across the country at the same exact time, right? Uh, in 1,200 neighborhoods at its peak. And that, this kind of work for decades had been in the hands of trained professional organizers who would go into communities and do this sort of thing, one community at a time, at a great, great cost, right? 
So these are amateurs. These are people who, in many cases, had no political experience, the people who were organizing these, these meetups. But the, the conviction of courage to borrow a phrase from earlier and stand up and say, yes, I will be happy to get some people together in my community. So what, what does it all add up to? What does it all mean? For me, I think we're entering this brave new, exciting landscape for how social change happens, how social actions happen. And who's in charge of it, right? And at what scale it's happening, too, at a national or local or, or even global level. And we talked about how, in the, in the Dean example, we were able to start with nothing. And by opening up the doors, making the process transparent, asking people to step up, um, volunteers and leaders and grassroots organizers all across the country, amateur organizers, they were able to, to together make the campaign and make uh, this movement building effort much stronger than any small group of us ever could have done or imagined on our own inside a campaign office. So we're seeing parallels, though, of this in all kinds of other contexts. And those of you who are here from the, from the media world know this and have experienced this firsthand. Um, the U.S. air crash in the Hudson, we all remember this? Not that long ago, right? No, okay. Um, the, news, the news of, the, of, the, of this crash was broken and spread 15 minutes online by individual citizen journalists before, 15 minutes before the mainstream media got around to covering it, or was able to even cover it, right? So it's a, it's a very stark reminder that anyone here, anyone with with now a cell phone, a mobile phone, a laptop, or a, a, even a digital camera, now has the ability, doesn't mean they will, but the ability to be, to be a, to have a megaphone. It's the, it's the Charlie bit my finger versus, versus CNN scenario we're in, right? <laughs> um, and so it's forcing major, it's forcing media to reevaluate re its model, but it's also forcing us uh, within the change making business to rethink how we do, how we, how we do our work. Right? So we know that everyone's, everyone has the power to be a journalist or a publisher or even a fundraiser at this point. Right? We've all gotten the a-thon, support my, like a-thon, whatever a-thon emails um, for good causes. Well now, what does it mean when anyone can be an organizer? So that's the question that I've been working on for, since, since my Dean experience. Um, and, and in my work uh, at Echo Ditto, which is the company I started with several colleagues coming out of the Dean campaign, this, this is the question we focus on, we got guiding social change organizations through, through, their, through the use of the web. But what we're seeing is, is that the, the movement leading organizations that are getting it and that are succeeding are those that are embracing this idea of the citizen organizer, the amateur organizer, and, and enabling it, um, enabling these, these free agents to go off and, and do, do some of this, this citizen, citizen organizing. So, in the spirit of storytelling, I want to share a couple with you that I think illustrate this uh, from my world. Um, just a week ago, I had the opportunity and honor to meet uh, Juan Rodriguez, who is the 21-year-old on the all the way on the left. Um, so, so Juan. Juan grew up in in Colombia, uh, in a very wealthy part of Colombia, and his family moved him when he was very young to, to Miami due to political instability in the country. So he immigrated to the US, ultimately became an excellent student, was on track to become a valedictorian of his class. And somewhere, you know, when he's 18, he told he's gonna have to give some speeches and start applying to some of the great schools in the area, he was being asked for a social security number, right? Discovers he's undocumented. Um, and unleashes a major zigzag in his life, right? All of a sudden joins the, uh, the immigrant rights movement um, and, and starts, working, starts working in the immigrant rights movement. Get, does get sponsored by someone to stay within the US, goes to school, and um, after having to say goodbye to uh, dozens of family members who had been, and friends who were being deported into midnight raids and all kinds of other things that were changing with US immigration policy, as well as his roommate uh, attempting suicide, he said, this is enough. All the, 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 the ways in which the national organizations, the traditional standard uh, labor unions and others are trying to organize us to change immigration policy and reform immigration policy are not working. They're not enough, and they don't line up with the, 
the, the fire in the belly that I have right now to do something about this issue. He said, I'm willing to put, I'm going to go put my life on the line for this issue. I, there's nothing, all my family is basically gone at this point. I, I have to do something. And he decided he was going to start walking from Miami to Washington, D.C., 1,500 miles, and um, starting January 1. So despite being warned that he was going through all kinds of communities where he's going to get shot at and his feet could be frozen off, he decided to do something that's not inherently unique. Marches have been happen, happening, right, for, for decades. But what was unique, and I'm collapsing what is otherwise a very powerful story, uh, what was unique was the fact that he was able to, to build a national story, an international story, in real time because, thanks to technology, others could follow along his story, right? And what happened was he was able to, and his colleagues were able to inspire marches in parallel in targeted congressional districts all across the country. When people heard his story and were able to say, yes, we will walk with you. Um, people were, he was able to build his own media channel to work directly with all those people through text messaging. And he also did, re they did reach, his, on through the Trail of Dreams, every uh, major national media outlet um, without the help of any of the established organizations that typically would have been doing this change-making work and national media work. Next is Mark Hannis, who, uh, a colleague of mine in Washington, D.C., uh, who, who grew up in Ecuador to the, as the grandson of four Holocaust survivors. Wakes up one day in Swarthmore, um, Swarthmore College here, and, uh, and says, wait a second, there's, there's still a Holocaust happening right now. Um, so obviously something very close to him uh, and realizes we need to do something about the genocide in Darfur and other countries. Using social media, Facebook organizes more than 400 people to come to DC to create the, help create the political will for the US, a key player in how um, genocide in Darfur will unfold, to uh, have one of the first major lobby days in DC on the issue. And now, in less than two years, the Genocide Intervention Network has gone from being a small student group to essentially a national scale organization and one of the, along with STAND, one of the largest uh, campus group of any issue, one of the largest uh, campus networks along with climate change um, across the country. And the final story is one that started here at Middlebury, um, many of you are familiar with and were involved with. Uh, this is a picture of some school children in the Philippines, um, one of more than 1,500 events that happened around the world simultaneously on October 24th, 2009, over 180 different countries. And I think the, the power of, you know, again, the power of this is not that individually these amazing events took place. While they are each in and of themselves amazing, if you've seen the photos of underwater divers and all these unfurling banners and the, the creativity of these different events, the power, it hit me standing in uh, Times Square on October 24th, alongside some of these other military organizers, looking at this jumbotron and seeing photos coming in in real time from all around the world, right? So it's the power to aggregate all these otherwise individual disparate voices and stories into one much larger story that's more powerful than any of the individual ones and more impactful in terms of our social change work. And uh, um, I can tell you that the, you know, the, in terms of talking about social impact, going to Copenhagen uh, for the climate talks and hearing the number 350 being uh, discussed in the hallways and being um, incorporated into the policy debates means that clearly this global action did have, did have an impact on the debates even though we did not get the, the outcomes we wanted. So let's take a final look at Tokay Hall. What would have been different, it's now 12 years later, if I was doing the same coffee house local organizing project what would have been different now that we're in this in this networked age, right? Well, I think at least at least two things, uh, and you may have more. But um, one, I don't think I would have been alone, right? It wouldn't have been just us there, you know, a handful of us coming together in the community. We may have 
maybe would have inspired coffee houses all over suburbia in America, right? <laughs> or student, or maybe we would have found out that there's a better way because a whole networks of people have already figured out this problem and come up with something better than a, than a coffee house, right? So I don't think we would have been alone in our, in our amateurness. And, um, and, and second, the way we on-ramp into issues, I think, is changing now. So I may not have done the coffee house and said, well, that was fun, let's go on to the next thing. That could have been a huge gateway for me into issue, the, the bigger issues that, that caused the, the, the problem in the first place. And maybe I would have focused on you know, started a career in smart growth and urban planning to avoid some of the isolation, figure out how do we eliminate some of the isolation that was created, that I, that I woke up in. Um, and I think the, the power and the power of all this for us right now is that the, this change making, what I'm seeing now is that the change making that's happening now versus when I got involved in in, in the, the industry of, of change, if there is one, um, is that it's just no longer in the hands of, of an establishment, right? Technology, we've learned, is incredibly disruptive, but it's also democrat has this incredible democratizing effect, which means that any of us now have the power to lead social change efforts and social impact, and, and in, the, in the, uh, the always wise words of, uh, of Governor Howard Dean, power is in your hands. Yeah.